Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Justin Estery. Uh, welcome to the uh, International Methods Colloquium. The International Methods Colloquium is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. This week's speaker is Fred Benke from the University of Iowa, uh, giving a talk co-authored with Xu Jin. Uh, proper, I hope I pronounced that right, probably I didn't. Uh, the talk is entitled, uh, Proper Specification of Non-Proportional Hazards, uh, Corrections, and Duration Models. Fred's talk will last between 30 and 40 minutes, after which point we'll take questions from the audience. You can call in to ask a question on the air in a toll-free call-in line if we can get it working. Uh, we've had some problems with it this morning, but the number is 1-855-982-9766. I'll let you know after Fred's talk whether we've managed to get it working. But you can definitely email questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com. Or you can ask a question using the GoToWebinar Ask Question box that appears on the GoToWebinar control panel. For our viewers outside the United States, we recommend using the Ask Question box to ensure that we receive your questions immediately. Sometimes email is a bit slow. Uh, a copy of the slideshow that goes along with the presentation is available in the handouts box in the GoToWebinar window, uh, window uh, and a copy of the paper is available there as well. And now I'd like to welcome Fred Bemke to the IMC. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Justin. I appreciate uh, you organizing this and giving me the chance to present a paper on. Uh, Justin assures me that there are people out there listening, so I'm just going to proceed as if that is the case. And I will presume that you will all laugh at my jokes appropriately uh, and go ahead and get started with the talk. I'll add that Justin and I have been sitting here comparing our various Paul Math swag um, since I have some in my office from the Iowa conference. I don't want to bring out of my 15 year old swag. mug from Washington. <laughs> He's promising lots of good stuff this summer for us, so hopefully everyone will be there. Uh, okay, as Justin mentioned, uh, this is a paper that's co-authored with Shai Jin. Uh, she's a graduate student here, and as these talks always start out, uh, I believe she'll be on the job market next year, and she's fabulous. Um, I've enjoyed working with her on this and some other stuff. Uh, so the purpose of this paper um, is to talk about the issue of non-proportional hazards models um, in the context of duration models. Uh, and so I thought I would talk a little bit about the issue, a uh, little bit about what we found when we go through the literature, um, and then sort of display some results of what happens uh, when people implement their correction improperly. Um, that's something that we noticed as we were, or something that I, I shall we say, um, suspected based on some things that I'd read and some conversations I'd had. Uh, so Shui took the lead in looking into this. Um, and doing a lot of the work on it. Unfortunately, I'm the one sitting here presenting it, uh, but it seemed like the best thing for me to present at the time. Uh, okay, so sorry, it's gonna take a little bit getting used to not having anyone to look at, um, but like I said, I assume that you're all out there. Okay, so in general, of course, this relates to the use of duration models to study the timing of political events, you know, how long wars last, how long people stay in Congress, uh, you know, how long it takes for someone to uh, make a decision about how to vote, or if you're not so much interested in political science, of course, these are applied widely in other contexts like biostats, uh, you know, how long people survive in the context of various uh, diseases or and how long treatments then influence their ability to continue to survive. Uh, and you know, what is common, um, standard duration models, I'll use that term sort of loosely, but think about parametric duration models like the Cox and Leibel, um, or if you think about the semi-parametric Cox estimator, these all assume what's called the proportional hazards assumption. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what that is more um, in a moment and give you some of the equations, but the basic idea is that the relative effect of a variable does not change over time. So as that you move forward through the course of someone's duration, the proportionate increase from a constant increase in one of the covariates is going to have the same increase in the hazard rate, uh, the same relative proportionate increase in the hazard rate. Um, well, violation of this, as you can imagine, that, that may be considered a strong assumption. I believe Box Steffensmeyer um, and Zor noted that that's one of the principal things you need to evaluate when you're estimating uh, these sorts of models. Violation of that is gonna lead to biased estimates and inaccurate interpretation. If the effect of one of your variables changes over time, say it goes from increasing the chance of um, failure to decreasing the chance of failure as the duration continues, and of course the estimate you get assuming the effect is constant is not gonna be representative of that entire path of effects. Uh, fortunately, there's been a long tradition of work on this issue. It's been well known. Uh, there are a variety of tests you can do. Uh, there are corrections for it that you can implement. They're generally well known and discussed in the literature um, and applied and discussed in the context of political science. 
As we found out though, uh, it turns out that the application of those corrections is not consistent uh, within the discipline. Uh, in, in particular, we'll highlight one issue that seems to be done incorrectly. Um, but typically what you do when you're trying to correct for non-proportional hazards, um, I, I should add that you can do either a test for non-proportionality of a single variable, or you can do a global non-proportionality test. I'll talk about this mostly in the context of a single variable, but of course everything I'm talking about here could generalize to multiple variables uh, violating the proportional hazards assumption. So if you do find a variable that violates, what you would do typically, uh, there are other solutions, but all the political science articles that we've looked at seem to take this approach. Uh, you interact the effect of that variable with time, and that therefore allows the uh, marginal impact or the effect of that variable to change over the course of an ongoing duration. As we note though, um, this is often misapplied, and the reason I think is because there's sort of a conceptual change here in the structure of your data. So if you go from having data where none of the covariates changes over time, time invariant covariates, to interacting one of them with time, well you've now created a situation where you have a covariate that pretty clearly changes with time since time itself is certainly a time varying covariate. Uh, and in some of the applications, scholars have not made that change uh, to their data set. And of course that, while correcting, while attempting to correct one problem, I sort of created another problem in the correction. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the problems that creates. And then of course, it turns out that the fix is relatively straightforward, which is that if you have a time varying covariate, you just need to modify your data to account for it. Um, and, and most studies that have time varying covariates don't have that problem. Um, and so the solution is pretty straightforward. This is not the most high end technical piece where we're going to make some really complicated point. I view this more as a reminder um, so that people don't accidentally uh, make this mistake. Um, I should add that having looked through the literature on this to, to sort of understand um, why, as, as I note to the next point there, um, the majority of studies that we found that were at risk of making this mistake, not to um, you know, use my metaphors too much, but uh, that faced a situation where they had time invariant covariates, identified a non-proportional covariant, and then attempted to correct for it, um, therefore did not already have data that accounted for time varying covariance, 70% of those studies implemented the testing correctly. That is a fairly large sounding number, um, but I should note that of the 40 or so studies that we implemented or that we inspected, about 12 of them had the opportunity to make the correction. We were able to get replication data and, and sort of make a determination for 10 of them. So that rep represents seven of 10 articles out of the initial sample of 43 articles in political science that um, were, were, that used a duration model and therefore potentially could test for non-proportional hazards. So the rate of the mistake is pretty common, uh, sort of total incidence of the mistake at this point from what we've identified is relatively low. As we'll show um, through a series of replications, a couple of which I'll highlight, the consequences of not making the proper adjustment to your data structure can be pretty dramatic in terms of changing the, um, the substantive understanding and the statistical interpretations that you'll have for your results. Okay, so let me take a moment and talk a little bit about the semi-parametric, uh, sorry, about the proportional hazards model uh, assumption. Again, we'll do that in the context of the semi-parametric Cox duration model. Uh, these, these, this assumption does apply to many, um, if not all, many but not all uh, pr parametric models. We talk about it mostly in the context of the Cox duration model, um, but again, a lot of the a lot of the results and approaches would, would be similar. But this is where it's usually applied. So if you have a semi-parametric Cox duration model, uh, we can think of it as a hazard rate where there's some baseline hazard and then that increases or decreases for any individual based on some linear combination of covariates uh, with coefficients, exponentiated. Um, the nice thing about the Cox model is that you don't have to specify what H naught of T is, which allows it to take on any shape. Uh, and then the way you estimate it um, through the partial likelihood approach cancels out that uh, baseline hazard and therefore you have, don't have to make any assumptions um, and you can account for any possible um, form of duration dependence through that baseline hazard. Uh, but again, you are making this proportional hazards assumption, which I lay out and explain a little bit below. There's a couple of ways to think about it. One is that if you have any two observations, I and J, that um, the relative probability, or, or sorry, I shouldn't say probability, um, I know some people have written papers that would correct me on that. The hazard, uh, the relative hazards will be the same at any point in time for those two observations, assuming that none of the covariates have changed, that we're done with time invariant covariates at this point. Uh, but I, I also think it's nice to think about in the context of, say, the effect of a single variable. You can think about it for multiple variables, but 
For a single variable, say if you have a one unit change in some variable xk, then that ratio of hazards when x is at its value or when it's increased by one is going to be the same at every point at which the observation um, could fail or at every point in time. So there's always a 10% increase, for example. Um, and again, if the effect of that variable changes over time, then that may not be the case. Okay, so uh, a picture to attempt to illustrate this, um, perhaps somewhat to my surprise, uh, it was a little bit harder to illustrate this, so the picture doesn't make it quite as, as stunning um, as I might have expected. Uh, but if you look at the black line, which is the reference hazard um, over time, then under the proportional hazards assumption, if you make a change in the variable, uh, then we have the yellow line, which is proportional. Uh, it decreases, it's about 60% the value of the black line. Um, and so that's a case where that assumption is met. And then I played around with um, interacting the effect of the variable with time uh, to create something that would be non-proportional. Uh, you can see that in the, in the medium gray line at the bottom. Uh, I don't know if you guys, if you can see my screen, you can probably see where my pointer is. So you'll notice a few things that make it clear that it's not proportional. This line, the gray line, tends to peak right around here, so it's increasing before and decreasing after, whereas these ones in peak a little bit farther out, so it's clearly not proportional because of that. As well, down here in this tail, um, the gray line is actually increasing while they're decreasing and crosses over them. So pretty clearly we have a non-proportional hazard here. Uh, so that gives you a feel for what it might look like uh, to see a non-proportional hazard over time. All right, so some substantive examples of these, again, there, there's a bunch of articles on these. Um, and interestingly, there, there's a lot of methods articles related to this topic. Um, Amanda Light, one of our uh, PhD students or graduates many years, a few years ago, I guess I would say at this point, uh, has an article on interpreting these and gives some examples as well as in some of her own substantive work. Luke Kilo, of course, has some nice work in this area. Um, the Park and Hendry piece that came out a year or two ago, these are all talking about tests or interpretation of non-proportional hazards. Uh, so some of the examples that have borrowed from that, again, these are not all my areas of expertise, so I apologize in advance if I don't do them justice. Uh, when you think about leadership turnover and the duration uh, between conflict and the duration of peace, you know, new leaders might get tested really early on a lot as, as other countries try and figure out if they're strong or if they're going to stand up for their country. Uh, but perhaps once they figure that out, then they're not going to test them as much later on. And so in early on, you might see a much greater risk um, of conflict for a new leader. Um, but that's going to decrease over time, and so the effect of being a new leader is going to be smaller the longer you're in office or the less of a new leader you are. Health interventions, again, this is uh, duration models are used pretty widely in other areas. Um, again, an intervention might have a really big effect early on, perhaps due to unmeasured uh, issues with compliance or just because the effect of some sort of treatment wears off over time, then you might see that intervention uh, start to not have as large an increase on the hazard over the course of the duration. Government duration is another area that's been studied pretty extensively. Uh, extensively. Uh, again, you might have a minority government form. It might be really unstable at first, but if it makes it through that period and there's confidence in it and it's effective, then the effect of being a minority government on the hazard might decrease over time and they're less likely to fail once they get through that critical period. Again, a lot of these, you can always think of these as um, representing omitted variables of strength or resolve or something. Uh, but again, those are processes that evolve over time and that we can learn about over time. And so if we're not accounting for that time dimension, then we're clearly uh, not going to be capturing how they change and therefore have model specification. Okay, so what do you do if you have non-proportional hazards? So there are, there are a number of tests. There's, there's um, I think, a couple beyond what we have here. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight uh, sort of, I think, three basic ones that are discussed in a lot of the political science literature. The first one is just to split your data uh, and say, you know, at the median failure or I'll take the first third of failures and, and the uh, last third of failures and just estimate the duration model in those two samples if you account for the left censoring and all that. Um, then you can compare the estimated coefficients and you can identify whether or not they have changed dramatically for observations that last longer, that are still at risk of failing later on compared to those that fail early on. And then you could, um, once you've identified the variables for which that's the case, you could then make adjustments um, and, and fix them. I'll talk about corrections in just a moment. Uh, second, there are various residuals that you can use. These are mostly specific uh, in the context of the Cox model. Um, Schoenfeld is, is one of the more popular ones. Uh, Kiel has a nice article talking about that. Um, I should note, I, I, a little bit of a plug for that article, I guess, but 
you know, he points out that, of course, these tests can diagnose all sorts of other misspecification issues, not just failing to interact your covariate with a function of time, um, omitted variable bias, all sorts of things um, could lead to a violation of this. But, you know, in the context of this talk, um, this is a way to evaluate it. Let's hope that you have your model otherwise correctly specified, and this allows you to identify uh, violations of proportional hazards assumption. Finally, um, you could just go ahead and explicitly model um, the possible change in the effect of a covariate over time, and then do a test, say, on the um, portions of that capturing the change over time and evaluate whether or not you would reject the null hypothesis of no change over time. Um, that last one is, is obviously requires a lot of assumptions about getting the function of time right, as to the corrections, as I'll note in a moment, uh, but, but it is a way at least to get a first start and potentially uh, properly correct for uh, violation of non-proportional hazards. Okay, so what do you do um, if you have a violation? Again, I'm, I'm talking about this largely in the context of a single variable. I think it's easiest to think through it that way. It's, it's pretty trivial to extend all of this to say, and the two variables or three variables that you're dealing with. Uh, but I'll just keep it to one. So the most common, and as far as I can tell from the political science articles that we've reviewed, the only um, correction that people implement when they do implement one is to interact the offending variable with some sort of function of time and then re-estimate the model. The hope, of course, is that you get that function of time right. Um, what this means is that you include some sort of interaction or series of interaction terms for your offending covariate xk with some function of time ft. That could be a polynomial. Um, it could be some sort of spline, um, as Keel suggests. Um, it could also, and most commonly, be the log of time. I have yet to figure out exactly why that seems to be the default. It's certainly not the only thing suggested, but that is by far the most common um, correction that you will see. And so just to make a little bit clear, and since, um, as I noted to Justin earlier, this is a relatively short paper. Um, we're pitching it for the new political analysis notes series, so I'll, I'll use that as an opportunity to plug that series. Uh, and so, you know, I, I added a little bit more information here um, for people that aren't perhaps as familiar with duration models. Um, so just to write out what that would look like in terms of estimation for the hazard, uh, the hazard for that observation at some point in time t, again, is the baseline hazard times some exponentiated linear combination of covariates and coefficients, where now we've added in an additional um, covariate, which includes the interaction between the function of time, and again, the, the beta 2 could be um, a vector if, if f of t is a little bit more complicated than just say the log of time. Um, uh, I just realized I was going to note something there. Um, I'll, I'll come back to it if I remember. Uh, again, most commonly f of t in political science and in other disciplines is the log of time. Uh, the recent Park and Hendry article points out that this isn't necessarily always the best assumption uh, and that it's, it's probably a good idea to explore and consider other possible functions of time. Okay, I just remembered what I was going to say a second ago. Uh, note that those of you that are familiar, of course, with all the literature on interactions, um, and as I think I've noted in the past, it seems about every 10 years in political science or economics or other fields, we need an article reminding us how to do this correctly. It's been about 10 years since the last one, uh, but I, I know it's discussed pretty widely. We don't have to include um, f of t on its own here because we're doing a Cox uh, semi-parametric model, and that would just get absorbed into the baseline hazard. Uh, so that other piece to it, that just log of time on its own, is actually accounted for. I don't have to explicitly include it. Any variable that's constant, a points, constant across observations at different points in time is going to be subsumed into the baseline hazard. We don't need to include it in a Cox model. In a parametric model, uh, you would obviously have to include that variable. Okay, so the second piece of this, and again, this is, I think, where we're, we're focused and where we're trying to, to say something here, um, is that since f of t, this function of time, is time varying, uh, it's pretty clear that you have a time varying covariant. Um, so you need to make sure that your data are set up um, and structured to account for the fact that you have a time varying covariant. And of course, that means that you're gonna need to do a little bit of work to restructure the data. Um, and then you can estimate the model basically the same, except it's gonna have these time varying covariates. Now it turns out, of course, that most of your other covariates or all of your other covariates, but at this point you have time invariant covariates, will not vary over time. Uh, but now you've introduced one that does. And so you need to uh, restructure everything to account for it. And based on the results that we're getting, the simulations we've run, and a little bit of math that I pulled together, um, you know, you're definitely going to want to do this because it looks like it's going to be problematic if you don't. So once you've restructured the data, 
then you should regenerate that or generate, I guess, uh, for the first time, that interaction with, with the log of time, let's say, just to use the standard example, and then estimate your model. Um, obviously, you don't want to restructure the data and not restructure that interaction term, uh, but I just wanted to remind people to do that. And then you have to interpret the effect of your covariate x, which now includes an interaction with time. Again, that will just build off of all the literature on interactions and how to estimate the marginal effect and the confidence intervals um, and all sorts of things, uh, the quantities of interest that you might be interested in. Again, I'll plug Amanda White's piece where she delves into this issue in particular in political analysis from a few years ago. Uh, we're going to follow her advice and approach there. So to highlight um, where, where things have gone wrong in these handful of cases, um, despite being a high proportion uh, that, that we've investigated, what happens is that people see that the correction is to include an interaction of the variable with the log of time. They create that interaction and they reestimate their model, I think without explicitly considering the fact that they've now included a time brain covariate. Um, that means, to give a little bit of intuition on that, we basically now have the log of the dependent variable on the right-hand side of the model interacted with uh, one of the covariates, but what we haven't done is account for all of those other points in time before the point in time of failure where the observation was at risk of failing but did not fail. So we don't have the proper information in our model that we're trying to estimate. Um, that's the same problem you have with any form of time varying covariate that you don't account for, is that that variable took on different values at previous points in time. The observation could have failed at those point in times. So we need to account for the value uh, or the information that we have um, that relates the covariates, including in, at this point in time, with the hazard or you know, the, the chance of failure. Um, and so again, we, if scholars start off with timing invariant covariates, um, relatively high rate of them do not then restructure their data. Um, I should note that um, th this includes a number of replication studies, um, and I'll talk a little bit about more about that when we get to um, our summary of how this has been handled in the literature. Uh, the second, and this is you know sort of a, a I don't want to say a less minor violation, but it's sort of like it's, it's partway there, is that scholars may have some time varying covariates. So if you're studying uh, the length of a war, uh, you know, in some data sets, that's measured in days. A lot of your uh, state level variables may vary at the annual level. Um, and so you will be having time varying covariates that change by year. But if you allow for a non-proportional hazard and you interact the offending covariate, the one that doesn't fit the, non -propor the proportional hazards assumption, with time, but you just interact it with, say, years or the log of the year, then, again, you haven't put it on the scale um, of your dependent variable, which is days. And most of the time when people would create, um, well, I, I, actually, I would say that will depend from case to case, right? The first year may be the log of one, second year may be the log of two, but if they fail at 829 days, sometimes that gets uh, read in there as the time variable, and it could be you know, the beginning of the year, the beginning of the second year, and then the date of failure, the, the, the value of time at failure. Uh, and so again, you're kind of mixing things here where um, your dependent variable is measured in days, but your interaction to account for non-proportional hazards is not varying at the level of days perhaps measuring at the level of years. And so that's kind of between not letting it vary at all and letting it vary properly at all the days. If you're going to measure failure in days, then you have to account for the, the risk of failure, the hazard of failure at every day before that point in time. And then your correction needs to be structured that way as well. So here you just kind of need to add a little bit more time varying information into your model. Okay. So the consequences of getting it wrong. Um, again, if you structure the data with time invariant covariates, you've ignored the possibility that observations could have failed before the point in time at which they do fail. Um, same thing as, as I just said with, with um, time invariant covariates, but not at the same scale. Now, clearly, both of these are leading to specification bias because you have not properly measured um, the value of time at all moments at which the observation can fail. Um, and, and I'll work through a little bit about what happens um, in the first case uh, on the next slide. So, so let me show you that. I'll, I'll preface this by saying, um, I decided to add this in late last night, and it sort of just came to me. Um, it's not in the paper, so it's entirely possible, since this is about 13 hours old, that, that there may be some mistakes in here. I certainly hope not. I think they're all easily correctable. Um, so, so let me kind of, this, this is one of the more uh, math-heavy slides in this talk, but since it is an international methods talk, I thought that might be uh, appropriate. So again, it, I, I thought it was easiest to restructure the way I'm writing out the model to think through this problem. Uh, so instead of thinking about the hazard rate, let's just think about the duration. So you know, you know, why is your observed duration? 
Um, we're moving a little bit away from a Cox setup, although of course the Cox would include any parametric model as a special case. I haven't said anything about the distribution of the errors here, so we can still think about this as a Cox model. Uh, we're estimating this with a Cox model. So here we have time invariant covariates, and so the um, actual duration is just a function of uh, the true values of the parameters times a covariate, a covariate that is interacted with the log of time, and then some other set of covariates to account for other stuff times the error term. This could be an exponential model, could be a viable model, could be more complicated than that. So what happens if we uh, leave out that term for the interaction of x with the log of time? Well, what I've done in the second line, again, I'm hoping you can see this, uh, I've pulled that out into a separate piece of the exponential um, to isolate it. And then, of course, we have this beta 2 in front of the log, so we can move that up to the exponent. Then we have an exponential of the log. So we're just left with y time raised to the power of beta 2 times that variable x1. Um, so if, if we don't include it in the model, again, that has to go somewhere. Um, you know, at this point, I'm just using algebra to rewrite this to figure out where it might go. Um, and to some extent, it goes in the error terms, but if you think about how we could rewrite the model, we could move that over to the left-hand side. That just leads to putting this exponent on the value of y. Then we could take the 1 minus beta 2 to the x1i root um, of both sides. That moves it over here. That's going to modify our error term. So obviously, our assumption about the error term is probably not correct anymore, um, as well as uh, because we have an exponential raised to a power, we can just put that inside the exponential. So we're dividing by 1 minus beta 2 x1 here. Um, since we don't know beta 2, I think of this as, as easiest to think about. It's, it's, it's almost like a weighted, um, you know, weighted regression interpretation of this, but you're estimating the constant divided by this. You're estimating beta 1 divided by this and beta 3 divided by this. Um, so pretty clearly, that you're, you're going to get different estimates than you would expect. Um, and again, depending on, say, the sign of beta 2 and the values of x1, you can flip signs here, you can dramatically change the magnitude. Um, if, if there is something in here that looks a little bit off, please email me. As I said, this is relatively new and added relatively late at night. Um, but I think it at least gives you a feel for what can go wrong, and it, it kind of shows that, that the effects can be somewhat dramatic since the sign can change, the magnitude can change. And of course, your standard errors are very likely going to be off as well. Okay. So um, before we move on to some of the replications we did, I thought I would talk over um, the results of our exploration of how this has been implemented or how the correction for non-proportional has been implemented in political science. Um, we were lucky to be able to start with the Park and Hendry study, which has 20 or 30, uh, maybe even more replications included in it. And so that gave us a pretty quick start on articles published in the, the sort of top three journals. Uh, we added some stuff on our own from some subfield journals uh, that's detailed in the, in the paper. We came up with a total of 43 studies that's not meant to be exhaustive, um, but it's pretty representative of, of some of the top journals for the last uh, 10 or 20 years, I believe. So of those 43 studies, 31 of them test for the proportional hazards assumption. Uh, 21 of those end up implementing a correction. Um, of those, uh, for example, there were cases where they had time invariant covariates or time, invari or time varying covariates not measured at the same level as the dependent variable. Um, there were 12 of those. Um, of those, we were able to get replication data for 10 of them. A couple of those, um, well, those two cases, using the text of the article, we're sort of speculating, but we feel pretty confident um, that the scale, that they had time invariant covariance, but didn't do it, didn't make that change, or, or they're on a different scale. So we could be off by one or two there. So then, so we're kind of working with this collection of 10 studies, um, since those are the ones we can look at in detail and, and, and determine how it was implemented. Uh, so if you move on to, the next component of the table here, what we see is that of those four started off with time invariant covariates, and six of them started off with time varying covariates from down here. So of those four that had time invariant covariates, three of them did not change the structure of their data from time invariant to time varying. Uh, we're calling that error rate one of 75%, which is, I think, more impressive than saying three. Um, and again, in that second case where we have six studies where the analysis scale does not match the time varying covariate scale, Four of those did not make the proper adjustment, so four out of six is 66%. Again, this previous 14 is just to keep track of how many um, of the studies had time varying covariance, so you can think about these relative to that total. Um, but six of them had the opportunity to make a mistake, um, four of them did, and so we're getting 66% of that sort of type two error, uh, error rate two, I don't wanna call it type two, and overall that's seven out of 10, which is 70%. 
So what we did is since we have the replication data for these, we went through and we uh, made the adjustment. Uh, so of course, this is the case where we're, we're very happy that there was so much replication data out there. Um, you know, our goal here is of course not to pick on anyone in particular. Um, we've got lots of articles here. There's, there's kind of an interesting, you know, a side note I think, but a sociology of science question here of how this has happened. Because if you read through the literature on this, there's, there's no article that says that you should do it this way. Um, and, and yet it seems to have happened and it seems to be per perpetuated um, in political science in particular, as, as I'll note at the end. Um, so it's just something that seems to have slipped by um, and happened in, in a number of these papers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of these articles that we're looking at are replication studies. Um, and so, you know, you, you might complain that there's a little bit of double counting here. You know, a lot of these papers are method studies where um, they're making a point like the Light or Keel articles about something else related to it, and they don't correct this issue. Since this is something that I think is clearly wrong, you know, it's ideally something you'd want to correct, um, you know, we, we can have a conversation later perhaps about, uh, you know, how we want to hold uh, the authors of replication studies, or they're not exactly replications, where they're trying to illustrate another issue with those uh, previous studies, and whether or not we want to hold their feet to the fire on fixing everything. At this point, my position is, you know, maybe you want to fix the things that are clearly wrong um, before you talk about uh, repairing other things um, that may or may not be wrong once you actually estimate the model properly. Uh, all right, so then rerun the analysis as reported in the paper, converting everything uh, to time varying covariates um, as they should be, or at least converting the data to time varying covariates, interacting the offending variable um, to time varying data and re-estimating. Now, at this point, what we've done is, is we've taken the initial test for a violation of the proportional hazards assumption under the base model, in which in many cases here is time invariant covariates, and then made that correction. We have not then gone on to retest for all the other covariates once we've corrected for um, the initial one because we've changed the structure of the data a little bit, and so you might want to do some additional work on that. Uh, here we're just trying to highlight the difference between if you correct it the way the authors did and if you correct it um, the way we're suggesting that you should. Okay, so again, um, so re reset up the data. Um, we create the interaction term for the offending covariate or covariates. And so many studies, there's many offending covariates with time. Uh, we estimate the model and then interpret the results so we can talk about the differences. Uh, we basically follow light suggestions. Uh, we plot the marginal effect of the, of the offending covariate on the derivative of the linear index x beta with respect to the offending covariate. Um, I think she calls this the combined coefficient. That might be a little more artful than the term I'm using here, but just to be clear, it's the coefficient on that variable xk that offends the proportional hazards assumption plus um, the interaction of what was the term that corrected for time, the log of time, times the coefficient for um, the, the variable k times some function of time beta hat kt. Okay, um, I'm gonna highlight a couple of results and then give you a summary of what we find overall. Again, we're not, we're not targeting anybody here in particular. We picked out a couple of graphs that we thought were somewhat representative as well as illustrating uh, some of the uh, types of changes that we saw in the results. Um, I should also note that, that this particular article is a little bit complicated because there's a bunch of imputation that's done in here. Uh, we tried to follow things as closely as possible to what the authors did. Um, I think it'd be reasonable to argue that the imputation could happen at a different point in time once we start restructuring the data. Uh, so the results might differ a little bit if we did that. But again, sticking as closely to what the authors did as possible, and these are the results we get here. Uh, so this is a study of how regime type conflict and its outcome affect the tenure of political leaders. Uh, there's a lot of variables uh, that offend the proportional hazard assumption here. Uh, we've picked out this one because this is a pretty dramatic change uh, in terms of the substantive and statistical conclusion. Here we have presidential democracies. Initially, the, um, the authors find in the, in the replication and we're able to replicate quite closely what the authors have, um, if not identically. There's an increase in the hazard early on, and then that drops off and effectively becomes zero and even a little bit negative um, uh, for, for very long durations. Uh, when we change the structure of the data um, from somewhat time varying covariates to time varying covariates at the level of the dependent variable, um, days of conflict, uh, that effect completely flips. It starts off negative, it, it, it becomes increasing, and it's positive um, after relatively uh, short durations. Um, well, after a relatively short amount of time. So certainly there's kind of a range in here. 
right, where the effects are somewhat similar, but out here, they're very different. I think the statistical and substantive conclusions that you get from this um, are, are very different. Um, I highlighted a quote that we have in the paper on the description of this, leader of presidential democracies, face significantly higher risk of losing office than leaders who rule over autocratic regimes, but the higher hazards of office tend to dissipate over time. Obviously our conclusion or the conclusion under this structure of the data is extremely different. Um, I don't do IR, I don't want to speculate, but I would say that in most presidential democracies, um, you know, there, there's term limits, or at least in a lot of them, and there's regular elections, so it's not surprising to me that um, it's, it's not uncommon that they tend to leave office more after, you know, a few years. Um, okay, so a second example, and then I'll move on to the summary. Uh, here we have an analysis of repetitive challenges, which uses the uh, amount of time that elapses between conflicts um, to evaluate repetitive challenges. Um, here, this is, we're illustrating a different outcome that we see in a, in, a, in a relatively high proportion of cases, where we have a variable that is generally significant in the original analysis, positive and significant early on, um, and then negative and significant, or for those of you, uh, you know, the 95% the confidence interval does not include zero um, with negative values here for longer durations. When we redo the analysis, we see a few changes. The general shape is quite the same. Um, but the magnitude decreases significantly both before and after the point at which it crosses zero. Um, and of course, the big difference is that we do not see statistical significance. So there's no statistical significance and the substantive effect is uh, much smaller. Um, so obviously you, 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 would, you would not conclude that there's really any relationship here. And even if there was substantively, it appears to be relatively small. Um, and so again, that, that would be a significant revision in the conclusion of the article. Uh, so to just generalize a little bit um, using these examples, uh, we, we went through all of these, and, and I will say that this is a very rough calculation. Um, Shwai and I just kind of looked at them separately and in an Excel spreadsheet recorded our impressions of whether or not there was a big change. I realize that's not a very precise term, uh, but again, we're just trying to give a general sense of what happens here. Uh, change in slope is a little bit uh, more straightforward. Uh, does it go from negative to positive over time? Change in significance, again, you have significance here as a function of what point in the duration you're at. So again, it's if there was a substantial change in what you might say about the uh, level and degree of significance, uh, so it could be that for twice as many points in time or, you know, for a lot of points in time, there is or is not significance in the reanalysis. Uh, we're, we're not really fussing with minor differences for something like that. And again, change in sign was the effect positive in one case, and now the effect is largely um, switching to negative or vice versa. Um, or a change in magnitude, you just saw an example of that in the previous one. Uh, here we have both a change in magnitude as well as a change in significance. So some of these we could code multiple ways. In this one, we have a change in sign. Well, we have a change in slope. Um, we have perhaps a change in significance because we have a fairly long period here to the left where this one's not significant. I don't remember off the top of my head how we coded that one. So overall, we see that there was really not any notable change in probably about 40 something percent of the cases. And in those 60% of cases left over, there was a combination of changes that we saw in both the slope or significance or even 25% of cases we saw um, that, the, that the slope of the interaction with time switch from positive to negative, some of those may be quite small changes, right? And again, it's just did the sign change in that case. Uh, they may or may not have been significant changes. And of course, we can, we can do more with that, but clearly the, the consequences are wide ranging um, and pretty substantial and seem to occur at a pretty high rate, right? Less than half of the coefficients that got interacted with time would produce substantively and statistically pretty much the same interpretation that they had um, before we did our reanalysis. Okay, um, so to wrap up, um, I would just say that political science is well aware of the issues related to this. You know, there's been a lot of important work talking about proportional hazard in the discipline um, roughly since the introduction of the topic. Um, it, we find, and it turns out, that um, researchers frequently do not implement this correctly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think intuitively this makes sense, and, and this is how we started investigating this, that when you have an interaction of a variable with time, well, you've, you've introduced a time variant covariate, um, and so you need to make sure you structure your data properly. Not doing so can lead to a wide range of problems, um, very, very big differences in the interpretation. Again, as I said earlier, there's nothing in the literature in political science that we found that says to do it this way. Um, there are probably cases where um, it, it's not made quite as specific to 
change to time varying covariance. Um, one might think that that's intuitive or not, um, but uh, you know, it's not like we've been told to do the wrong thing and we're doing the wrong thing. I think you know maybe some mistakes were made and then that got perpetuated, or independently, uh, people have not just. Uh, you know, thought about the consequences of implementing this correction. And again, many of these uh, cases where it's not done correctly are replications. Um, you could argue that the authors are trying to stick as closely to the original study um, as they can. We've probably done the same thing. Um, so I don't want to suggest uh, that that's too harsh, but um, those are cases where that, that adjustment was not made. And so the other conclusions that are drawn from those studies, um, even if the replications are making other methodological points, you, know, you, you might still question those at least for that particular application, not that they're wrong in general. Uh, because of the sort of sociology of science aspect to this, uh, and because if this is happening in other disciplines, we'd, we'd like to point it out. Uh, you know, if, if uh, I'm sure political analysis, if we're lucky enough to publish this year, um, would, would, would love to have us make the point for other disciplines so they can read it um, and hopefully uh, cite the article, um, again, if we're so lucky. Uh, it, I look through sociology because I, I know that people in political science have published articles about uh, duration models, um, proportional hazards, I believe, was part of that. And sociology, uh, you know, going through all the sociology articles that mention like duration or uh, survival models that I found on JSTOR, you know, the first few hundred, I didn't find any that actually reported or went through the details of a test for non proportional hazards or that adjusted their analysis because of it. I talked to a couple of my friends in sociology, they couldn't think of any. Um, so at the very least, it doesn't seem that the opportunity uh, to make that point in sociology is high, although I, I'd be surprised if it's not. And I just didn't find them um, scanning hundreds of articles uh, through JSTOR. Um, Shry also looked through um, articles, I, I think it was uh, maybe in biostats, um, a more health-related area because we figured they were used a lot there. Um, she didn't report identifying any cases of misapplication there either. So this, at this point, it, our sense is that this is something that has happened in political science. Um, again, um, relatively low incidence, but uh, relatively high rate. Uh, and so we're helping that sort of us talking through this will help eliminate that in the future. Um, you know, and help us focus on all the other things that we're interested in um, when we when we write the papers that are analyzing the data where we have durations and potentially non-proportional hazards. So I will wrap up there, um, and Justin, I believe, will relay questions to me. Thank you all for watching. Um, thanks, Fred, for that presentation. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> At this point, Fred Bemke is able to take questions from the audience. Uh, we did get our call in line working, so you may call in to ask a question on the air at our toll-free call in line. The number is 1-855-982-9766. You can email questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com. Finally, you can ask a question using the GoToWebinar Ask Question box that appears on the GoToWebinar control panel. For our viewers outside the United States, we recommend using the Ask Question box to ensure that we receive your questions immediately. And <clears throat> while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Fred, I have a question myself. So um, if I understand your point correctly, uh, the issue is you are not including in your data set all the observations um, for other values of the interaction between T and the variable of interest where mm -hmm. you don't fail, right? That's right. the that's the critical thing. Yeah. Um, it seems like then, so you're, you're saying it's a specification issue, but it seems like it's actually a selective censoring issue. Like the specification is correct, right? In other words, T is interacted with F. The list of variables, yes, yes, yes. You just are leaving out like all the observations except one. It's as, th it's as though you, you, you selected only, you selected on the dependent variable, in other You're words. Only, yeah, if you think about what the data look like when you restructure it, uh, with time varying covariance, and what you're basically doing is say, just add an if statement. So if it's the point at which it fails, only include that observation. Right. Uh, I, I would hesitate to call them observations just because they're all part of the same ongoing duration, which you can think of as a single observation. Uh, but yeah, you're leaving out all those points in time at which it could fail, where all the covariates are taken on the same values. But, so that's partly how we actually estimate some of these, is just say, just add that conditional statement to only include that last point in time when it fails. Yeah, that's, I mean, when, when you had your, uh, the part where you were demonstrating, you said you, the part you said you came up with last night for just the sort of little proof, I was thinking about, okay, you know, I, I was, I had the, your slides pulled up and I was trying to sort of work through what that, I, I'm not, you know, the, the functional form is written down correctly in the sense that the, 
the parametric model is right, right? You actually factor that out and then put it on the left-hand side, but I'm thinking, well, the model is actually written down correctly. The problem is just that you omitted all the observations except one. Yeah, I, th I think that's part of it, but it's, it's written out correctly uh, given that um, I'm not subscripting observations by time there, right? So you would obviously want to subscript the value of the time variable with time. Um, so it, it, you've left out observations where time takes on very specific values. And th this kind of ties into how I had thought about um, getting intuition for this, for why this is a problem earlier. If you take a data set that has time invariant covariance and you structure it as if it has time varying covariance, so you create one observation for every point in time at which it could fail before it does fail, all the covariates will take on the same values. If you estimate the model that way with the identical information, you get the exact same result as if you set it up uh, with just one observation because nothing's changing. Restructuring it doesn't actually affect um, the estimates in any way, but it, it helps me think about the consequences because now we've restructured it, but when we put in that time variable, if we don't make it change at every point in time, then we have the log of y at the first point in time, the log of the outcome at the second point in time, at the third point in time. So then what you've done is you've taken that one variable, which is the log of time, um, which if you had estimated it the same way you do with time invariant covariance, would be the same across all points in time and not properly measured it. So it's, you can also think of it as a measurement issue. Um, and of course, you've then got the log of time on the right-hand side of your equation, which is you know, immediately red, red flags for me always go off um, when you do that. W once you allow it to change over time, then of course you're measuring it properly at every point in time. And so it's not that you have the dependent variable on the right-hand side, it's that you have the value of time at every point in time on the right-hand side. And your observation happens to fail at one of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so whether or not it's a sort of measurement issue of that variable of time or kind of a specification issue that you haven't properly subscripted the variable time and then included those other variables, I think you're probably right that, that it's more accurate to describe it as the second. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm no, I, I'm, I'm, my expertise does not lie in, in duration and survival models, so I'm, I've, you know, I'm just sort of thinking about how I would explain this to myself or to my students. Um, probably someone with more expertise would be able to clarify that better. Oh, we have a question from uh, uh, Brad Jones. So uh, why not just fully split the data by spells and es estimate, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll start over. <clears throat> Jeez. Why not just fully split the data by spells and estimate a discrete time analog? This strikes me as a reasonable approach, especially, especially in those examples with lots of offending covariates. It strikes me as a natural implication of your argument. Yep. Um. So that, that would work too. I mean, any model that, if you were to write out a discrete time model, just say a logit model, binary time series, cross-sectional kind of logit model, uh, which, is, which would be the, the discrete analog of the continuous time model, uh, that would work fine. Uh, you, would, you would still, again, assuming that the covariate changes over time, you would want to include an interaction of it with time because when you go to the discrete model, you naturally change the structure of the data to fit uh, the units of the outcome variable. Uh, so days or, or years or whatever it is, that would make the correction just as easily as, as we do. Um, our approach um, is basically the same thing because by restructuring the data for time rank covariates, we've created an observation for every point at which um, the, the unit could fail. You would have the exact same thing in a discrete time model. Uh, and the only difference would really be in the estimation. And of course, you'd have to tweak how you count for the um, duration dependence. Of course, the logit is going to look very, very similar to a Cox model. You know, they, they, they're almost the same thing, not exactly. Um, if you were to say put in, um, you know, the appropriate spline to capture duration dependence or just a series of fixed effects for time. But, but you know, your specification would end up looking basically the same. You'd have the same covariates, you'd have some function of time, then you'd interact covariates with time. Uh, I will say that, Brad, I think you're on record saying that uh, the Cox model should be used instead of a lot of these uh, discrete models in, in your SPPQ paper, but you know, I, I persist in using the discrete model in a lot of cases. So uh, in terms of your question, I think it would work either way. You know, it's, it's, it strikes me that this is kind of a, a problem that software um, might enable you to avoid. In other words, software can make it easy to make mistakes or it can make, e make it easy to not make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, because I'm sort of uh, thinking back to, uh, for, oh, well, 
I'm, I'm thinking back to um, when I was uh, teaching this, the, the way that you um, specify a, um, uh, 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 these kind of models in Stata, you can actually specify a time varying covariates option and it tries to sort of do some, a little bit of this for you. It's been a while since I've thought about this, so I'm, I can't remember the exact details. I'm wondering if there are ways that we could re restructure the way that these things are, are written in software to make this mistake harder to make. Well, I think I think that it, given that I think of it as a conceptual issue, um, that you you have time invariant covariates and your model is correctly set up and specified in Stata RR to estimate that way, um, but then you make this change that if you you know don't really think about it a lot could changes the way you need to structure your data. Then there's really no way to tell the software or to have it fix it for you without you telling it that there's been this conceptual change. Um, as, as we note in the paper, it's actually relatively straightforward to do this in Stata. Um, some of our replications we did it in R wasn't terribly difficult there either. Stata has a command called stsplit. Uh, and stsplit will just take uh, data that are time invariant and then just create one observation uh, for every point in time at which you could fail on the scale of the dependent variable. So you run that command, you regenerate your interaction, you run your model. It's basically three lines of code. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, since you did mention the, uh, the, the Cox version of time variant covariance, the TVC option in Cox, I would, I would um, remind people that that doesn't actually always do what you think it does. Um, you still need to think about the structure of your data if you specify that observation. That basically creates the interaction of the offending covariate with time. Uh, you also get to specify the function of time when you do that. That will not fix the issue with how you structure your data. Um, that does not. That is not a way to just tell it you have a time variant covariate. That's a way to allow the effect of a time variant covariate to vary over time. I think that's a case where software actually is deceptive in what you might think it's doing um, as opposed to what it's actually doing. And something that I find that students often do in my class um, when I teach it, they'll use that TVC to think they're actually putting in TVCs. They're not. Um, so just just a little side note there to be careful with that option. You still have to restructure your data. Um, Brad has has uh, responded again. Yeah, uh, there is a Cox analog to a conditional logit, so yeah. he and I am on record on saying both things because they are the same thing. Yeah, I, it's, it looks a lot like the C log log if I remember. So um, I'm, I'm stepping back from this a little bit. Um, it, it, it does seem like a, a fair number of, of methods papers end up. Uh, sort of being like, here's some mistake we're making, and you know, stop making that mistake, which is appropriate. That's that's sort of part of what our job is. But it makes me think a, a little bit about the review system. Like one uh, one thing I would expect, or I would hope, is that uh, these kind of things are you know, peer review is a filter against uh, these kind of things. I guess publicizing it kind of makes that possible. Um, but I'm 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 a little bit curious. Uh, about how these sort of things keep keep sort of keep making it into the published literature, not just this particular problem, but lots of different problems that sort of end up uh, there ends up making demand for this sort of paper, right? Saying mm -hmm. stop doing this. Is there is that just sort of an unavoidable consequence of how of of what science is or something, or or is there something we could do better? Uh, well. First, I'll say that I think that this is an easy mistake to make. Um, you know, you read an article that says, oh, you have a variable that violates proportional hazards, interact it with the log of time, and then re-estimate your model. Well, you've got your data set up, you have a variable called time, which is usually the time of failure. You multiply the log of that by independent variable and re-estimate your model. I, I can definitely see how people would make that mistake. Uh, in terms of the review process, this is the kind of thing that it's really hard to know if someone did it right if, there isn't just the right sentence in the article, right? Having looked through all these sociology articles to figure it out, a lot of times it's not clear. And so you have to find a statement um, that makes it clear because just looking at the table of results, there's no way to know um, if, if it was restructured and specified correctly. Uh, so in, in that sense, I, I think the positive thing, I mean, one, peer review, it, it's just, it might not be able to catch it. Um, it it's a question worth asking, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of questions you can ask when you're reviewing an article, but on a more positive note, I think that the reason that we're able to go back and reevaluate these articles is because of improvements in uh, data sharing, uh, replication, and all of that. And so I think the journal process in general has improved in a way that makes it easier for us to make this methodological point. 
Um, and hopefully that makes people more aware of it so that it's less of an issue in the future. You know, I, I, I tend to think that, that again, if, if someday when we get this published, um, reviewers might be then become aware of the issue and, and raise it, uh, you know, I mentioned an article, which, which I'm happy to have happen. Um, and, um, the second thing I was I was going to add to that is that you know, I, I think of this one as somewhat different than some of the uh, methods papers like we're doing things wrong, we should do them right. Uh, I think this is a clay case where, you know, some of those are somewhat subjective, like, hey, we should estimate multi-level models um, because stuff is clustered at some geographic unit. Well, sure. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes that that's an improvement. Sometimes it's not. You know, here we're doing something just just wrong, I think. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to say that's what I think is happening here. Um, and it's not really a subjective thing. It's not a, you know, there are situations under which this might be okay. Those situations are, as far as I can tell, basically non-existent. It may not do much harm, but you're basically specifying your modeling correctly given the information you have. So we know that we should at least be worried about the results you're getting. Uh, so I think there's a difference between, hey, you say you're doing this, but you're actually doing this. And, you know, maybe there are some additional things here to worry about. Not that we shouldn't do either of those things, but, you know, I, I view this as more of a factual uh, type of correction than, you know, kind of a, um, a, a bigger picture, something to think about correction. Right. This is different than, for example, um, you know, you can think of another example. You mentioned one example. Another example is, oh, well, you're estimating, a, you know, some sort of regression, correlational regression. You really ought to be instrumental variables or something. That's... That's really, you know, maybe yes, you know, maybe not, but that's a that's a, almost a philosophical or epistemological difference. Whereas this, you seem to be saying this is just wrong. You know, in other words, it's, you know, it's like a math error. Yeah, um, that's what I think now. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, uh, that's all the time we have. We're, we're at the end of our uh, our time period. Uh, uh, this is the final talk for the semester, uh, but we we will be back uh, with a new program of speakers in the academic year 2016-2017. So stay tuned to our website, www.methods-colloquium.com, for uh, announcements of next year's program, which will probably be coming out uh, late in the summer. Uh, Fred, thanks very much for giving our uh, final talk of the season. Yeah. And uh, I'll see everyone in the fall. Thanks for being here. Thank you.